Praise the Lord, friends. It's a joy to share God's word with you this week. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. I pray that it will cause us to love you and follow your ways all the days of our lives. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for reflection this week is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. The triumphal entry. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a cold tide on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a cold tide at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing? Untying the cold? And they told them what Jesus had said. And they let them go. And they brought the call to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, if you spoke of Jesus, Jesus' triumphal entry to a Roman uh, then, they would have laughed at you in the face. For them, a triumphal entry was an honor granted to a Roman general who won a complete and decisive victory and had killed at least 5,000 enemy soldiers. When the general returned to Rome, they had an elaborate parade. First came the treasured captured from the enemy, then the prisoners. His armies marched unit by unit, and finally, the general rode in golden chariot put by magnificent horses. Priests burned incense in his honor, and the crowd shouted his name and praised him. The procession ended at an arena, where some of the prisoners who were captured are thrown to wild animals for entertainment. And... Uh, this was the picture of the triumphal entry then. Now, when we look back to the text, it starts with now when they drew near to Jerusalem. This is Jesus and the disciples. We might think this is Jesus' first time to Jerusalem, but the Gospel of John tells us of many previous trips. Jesus, like any other devout uh, Jewish man, went to Jerusalem for as many uh, of the major events as possibly he could attend. Now, this time round, there was going to be an annual Passover celebration, a very significant feast declared by God himself to the Jews to gather together to remember God's faithfulness through the years. Many families from all Israel would come to the temple and bring a lamb for sacrifice, and the priest would be inspecting the sheep to make sure that they are spotless just as God had instructed. Now it's time for Jesus to present himself to his people. Expectations are high. We also notice that Jesus sends his disciples to get the cold. Throughout the book of Mark, we see some of the ways in which Jesus trained his disciples. One thing we notice is that he always delegated responsibilities to them. He did not do everything on his own, even though there were many things that he could do better. Instead, he gave them tasks so that they could be involved. And this helped them in following Jesus and uh, knowing that it is not just a passive job of sitting around him and listening and watching him do all these things. It is instead an active job which requires serving by doing. If you're discipling people, always try to find ways uh, in which they can help. And if you're a disciple, a follower of Christ, always seek ways to help. Jesus also demonstrates his omniscience. Jesus wasn't just good at guessing. He knew where they would find the cult. He knew what questions would be asked. He knew the outcome. All of them came true, just like he said. He knew the owner, what the owner would ask and what was going on. And the disciples could then, give, could then get permission. And this is, in fact, what happened. Looking through Psalm 50, verses 10, there's a reminder that everything belongs to God. The owner of the cult did not resist offering help. Or hold back, he offered what he had with an open hand. And this is what God expects of you 
and I, because we are stewards. If you were the owner, would you have offered the cold? Obviously, this is a hard question to answer. A better one is, do you offer what you have now to God with an open hand, or do you hold it back? Everything belongs to God anyway. Whatever you have has been given to you to manage by God and not for your own ambitions. Now, we also see the cult uh, and want to find out the significance of the cult. So while Jesus entered as a king, he was not entering as a normal king. What do you think a typical king would ride? He would probably ride a powerful war horse. Jesus instead chose to ride a donkey. Hardly appropriate for a conquering king, for a king. And yet a donkey, a colt, portrays meekness and humility. Jesus wasn't coming to conquer but to offer peace. Even if in this most triumphant moment we see clearly Jesus' humility, a prophecy which is fulfilled in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, a fall of a donkey. Verses 8 to 11, we see praises to this king. A king is welcome. The people spread their coats and leafy branches freshly cut on the road. Now, this is not a typical way to welcome someone. Have you ever been welcomed like this before? Think about it. People were putting their clothes on the dirty road for a donkey carrying Jesus to ride over. Why? This was a way to show their respect and submission to Jesus. Their enthusiasm brimmed over as the joy and excitement of the moment infected the crowds spontaneously. Hosanna! Shouts of Hosanna rang in the air. Hosanna! Hosanna is a Hebrew word. Hosanna. It's a contraction of two words. Save and please. Hosha and na. It means something like save now. Give us help from our operation. Now the crowds praise was scripture. Quoting from Psalm 118 verses 25 to 26. O Lord save us. O Lord grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord. From the house of the Lord. He comes. Jesus received a king is welcome. More than that, the people expressed their belief that Jesus could save them and that Jesus' coming to Jerusalem was the beginning of the kingdom of David, which they had been waiting for. It seems clear that they believe Jesus is the Messiah and expect that he is coming to Jerusalem to establish his kingdom. This is what they had been waiting for a long time. Now the moment had finally arrived. You can almost feel the excitement triple in the air. In fact, when the religious leaders of his day objected, he told them, I tell you that if this should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Luke 19.40 Now, everything seems great. Jesus is widely popular when he's coming into Jerusalem. The people in Jerusalem unite together welcoming him as they're praising the king of the Jews. But then what could go wrong? How could these crowds who were so widely supportive turn against Jesus and join in refrains? Crucify him! These questions are not easy to answer, but it does demonstrate how people's hearts are changing frequently. Following Jesus is so much more than being carried away with emotion during an, excite, an exciting moment. It requires a deep root. It takes commitment. In fact, it's true throughout all of scripture. Following Jesus isn't something you can do at night where no one notices. It's a 24 hour a day commitment that will interfere with your life. That's not a small print. It's a guarantee. In a book, Not a Fan by Kylie Idleman says, my concern is that many of our churches have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week, all of the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. What is it that is conquering or competing for your allegiance to Christ? What is it you keep looking back at? Are you a fan or a follower? Father God, 
help us to internalize these words and examine our hearts to follow you and follow you for all the days of our lives. Help us, we pray, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.